Mamurcha scope. If photographs could talk, this picture that you see above would say Mamurcha scope. Mamurcha means folding in Malagasy, and scope is for microscope. Um, a few colleagues of mine uh, with NGOs uh, and friends and my students found ourselves in Madagascar a couple of months ago. We're trying to tackle the idea Around that the health, world. education, biodiversity California. loss, environmental loss, all have roots that are joined together and you have to tackle them together. This is, this is in Madagascar in a place called Ranamafan, uh, which is uh, a fairly remote place. Uh, this is one of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, and we are trying to teach this idea that you could try connecting germ theory, uh, the fact that there is invisible life forms on this planet that actually make us sick, uh, the fact that there are microscopic diversity that you don't even appreciate and understand in ecology. Uh, and we do that uh, with a tool uh, called a foldscope. Uh, uh, this is a very, very simple microscope. This is not the first microscope that I made in my life. Uh, my very first microscope I remember uh, when I was a kid was built uh, by stealing my brother's eyeglasses. Uh, I thought I could uh, get away with it. Uh, don't do that. Uh, but one of the contexts that ends up happening is when you start bringing a new tool to a community uh, that has never been exposed to this idea that there could possibly be life uh, that you cannot experience. You see these shy kids starting to put together their very first microscopes. Very soon, something really remarkable happens. Uh, people self-assemble. These are teachers in training uh, that are training to be high school students, all gathering together around this idea of exploring the new world. One of the things that the students do in this process is learn how to do peer teaching. The fact that they are outdoors, we had to fight the principal to make sure that we can still learn outside a classroom. That concept uh, somehow didn't uh, manage to percolate. But one of the fascinating things that happens is the surprises. So this is a true unpredictable moment that you're going to see where certain kids realized we're going to watch parasites. <laughs> this is not staged. And of course, they find uh, how. How in Malagasy means lice. That's a live lice uh, that this kid is watching that is plucked on her own head. And you start realizing that's raka. Raka means blood. This is the first moment that you start to connect that, aha, this is a parasite that was feeding on me. And that was coming from an idea that this kid came up with, who's six years old. And you start thinking about this, of what happens when you land with a tool in a community and start sharing. And this is a concept of thinking about not just dictating what they're doing, but just letting, sitting and watching. Now, if I had given this tool to all of you, this is what you would be seeing. This incredible biodiversity that exists on the planet and the microscopic life. Can anybody guess what that is that you see? Uh, that's correct. Uh, but you see these incredibly arrow-like things. These are diatoms. Diatoms are actually alive when you catch them. They glide. In fact, no scientist can actually tell you how they do that. And the fact that you can just look and stumble upon open problems clearly creates this notion of exploring science with a sense of wonder. A lot of people ask me why I do this. And I tell them I just want to make people curious. You know, the sense of wonder is so powerful. We have often joked that we put together a sensor in the tool to make sure it's working. It's the smile that a person gives out. Uh, and curiosity is the mother of innovation. When you really engage with science, science turns curiosity into questions, questions anyone can ask, questions anyone can answer, and with critical thinking and scientific tools, maybe even distinguish fact from fiction. <laughs> One of the aspects of this work that I love the most is the community. The community has been growing all the way from slums in Mumbai to slums in Kenya to Nepal. We have people who are passionate about saving bees to people who just love mosquitoes or love to hate mosquitoes. Uh, we have sixth graders and we have 96-year-old biology teachers. And the passion of this community is really where the peer learning lies. 
couple years ago, when we wrote the paper, uh, we thought that, okay, the problem is solved, but it's not so easy. This is one of the challenges of making frugal tools, is you have to share them. So for the last four years, we've been building and building, and last two years ago, we shared 50,000 of these tools to 130 countries around the world. And we're not stopping, because we can't stop. You see, this map is not completely filled as yet, so there are billions of kids that still don't have access to these tools. And this has created a community, a grassroots of questions that people answer. And so you can go on the site and check what work people do, all the way from uh, a few of my favorites are uh, detecting fake currency from a kid in Nigeria uh, to uh, <laughs> a kid in Namibia actually studying some of the largest bacteria that are only found in Namibia. And this list goes on and on and on. Uh, I wanted to mention this, why we do this at the first place. The world is not divided in developing countries and developed countries. The world is divided in haves and have-nots. This is the same thing that shows up in healthcare and that shows up in education. We have more than a billion people on this planet who have absolutely no access to healthcare, and we have around a billion kids that ha live in poverty. One of the contexts that you start thinking about this when you connect these dots is what role do scientific tools play in both these endeavors? This is what it looks like uh, if you were to show up at a health care clinic out in the field. My lab has been working for the last five years uh, out in the field, and this is where we get our inspiration for many of the projects. But at that same time, this is also where the rubber meets the road, where healthcare workers that we work with are the ones that provide us the key insights that we need to really build and design tools. Maybe I'll share one or two with you. Uh, this is an uh, older brother of Foldscope uh, that we just tested in Kenya for diagnosis for schistosomiasis, which is primarily designed around the idea that healthcare workers get a significant amount of eye strain if you're going to be imaging for 10 hours. So, this is another tool where we're trying to bring molecular diagnostics, now to be able to diagnose all kinds of diseases in a modular fashion, but inspired by the very old punch card tapes. How many of you have programmed or know what I'm talking about uh, with punch card tapes? Wow, this is Stanford, so <laughs> uh, that's good. That's very good. Uh, we realized that we could actually utilize the precision that's embedded in these pa punch papers to really drive chemistry. And I have a student heading out in Kenya to test this for malaria. Uh, one of the other tools that uh, was just described is a new tool that we came up with, which is called uh, Paperfuge. Now, diagnosis is like searching for a needle in a haystack. It takes a long time because probably you have only few parasites. And we made a realization that one of the world's oldest toys, first of all, uh, nobody knew how it worked, but uh, once we figured that out, uh, I'm sh has any of you played with this toy before? It's called a whirly gig or a run run. And now I'm ramping it up. I'm gonna load it. That acts as the, the torsion in these strings. And once I get this started, I load the sample in the center disk. And now, I don't know if some of you can hear that. And one of the contexts of this is a very simple toy that I could pass to this gentleman that's sitting right here, and he'll be able to learn in five minutes and start driving this. But do you want to guess how fast this is spinning? This is not spinning around 5,000 RPM, 10,000 RPM. We can get these tools to spin around 100,000 RPM. And that's enough to separate blood in 30 seconds or malaria parasites in a few minutes. And one of the contexts that we can do, so this is live uh, filariasis, all components of blood can be separated out anywhere. And then, once you want to detect them, you take the tool like this, the capillary, and put it in a full scope to watch. Maybe I'll share one last tool, which is also a recent uh, project that we announced. It's called a Buzz. Uh, idea that you can take a regular cell phone. Uh, I couldn't find uh, my flip phone, uh, so I brought a smartphone that, was, uh, that I use. But a regular flip phone, or a dumb phone it's called, has the capacity <laughs> to be able to record acoustic signatures from mosquitoes. And that allows us to speciate mosquitoes. So if you've never heard this before, I'll irritate you with the buzz of a mosquito. 
Although that sounds irritating, that has all the information we need to speciate what exact mosquito it is. There are 3,500 species of mosquitoes, but only 20, 25 actually carry pathogens that are infectious to humans. So you can have a mosquito that's a nuisance, or you might have something that's going to carry Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, or all of them. Uh, so one of the contexts, we built the very first and largest acoustic database, all recorded from that $10 flip phone that you see up there, uh, to be able to speciate and differentiate all these species. And one of the power of this is to really give this back to the community. All of you could now engage in this project and essentially build real-time maps of mosquito acoustics around the world. Okay, so in my closing words, uh, again, if photographs could talk, this one will set tell you, hey, Dad, give me my microscope back. Uh, but in more seriousness, uh, I had come back, and uh, three months, four months had passed. I'd forgotten a little bit about Madagascar. I mean, those memories are alive. And suddenly, I received this packet of 30 paintings made by those very same kids describing the natural wonder that they see. And one of the contexts that I want to do uh, just because I caught back from March for Science, and it was an incredible experience, uh, is the fact that we need to make a promise. As we stand for science, we need to make a promise to make science accessible to everyone. Not just the people who can afford it, but the billion kids who can't. Science and scientific literacy should almost be a human right. Once you pass this tickling feeling of being able to discover something to the next generation, they are the ones that have to tackle a large number of problems that, are leaving, that we are leaving behind. So I hope you join in that promise, and thank you.